Okay, well, let's get started. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining in on this webinar. Um, this is one of the, the first ones we've done to, to a large group, so uh, we're looking forward to sharing this information, and we're also looking forward to getting feedback and ideas for future webinars. Um, so, again, my name is Joe Sanchez. I manage the Application Engineering Department, and I'm going to introduce Houston Fullerton. Um, he's one of our application engineers, and he's the one who put this presentation together um, in conjunction with the rest of my department. So, Houston, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar. As Joe mentioned, my name is Houston Fullerton. I'm an application engineer at Fitzer US. Today we're going to go over a semi-hermetic reciprocating section of the software. As Joe mentioned, this is going to be one of the first in a series, so future sections should include the CS, HS, OpenDrive, two-stage, and scroll compressors. Uh, one note, this webinar is going to assume some basic familiarity with the software. We're going to go through a compressor selection, results, limits, dimensions, and information tabs, as well as operating modes, tables, and coefficients, the parallel section of the software, and then wrap it up with accessories and a few additional options. So let's go ahead and jump right into the software. If you haven't downloaded this already, you can do so from our website using the service section. We have a, uh, a web version as well. When you open up the software, it brings you to a home page. I'm going to go ahead and start with a semi-hermetic reciprocating section. This brings us to our main selection. I'm going to start out. We've got um, a few options here at the top of the screen. Country, language, and unit selection. To the left-hand side of the screen, we have all of our software inputs. I'm going to choose a refrigerant of R449A since this is one of the new ones that's becoming more popular. As you notice, when I selected this, we got a blue info button to the right. If I click on this, I get some general information on the new low GWP refrigerants, as well as some general hints for R449 and 448A use. Since this is a glide refrigerant, we now have the option to choose a reference temperature of dew point or mean temperature. Dew point would be good for compressor comparisons, I'm going to choose mean temperature here since this will provide a little bit more accurate selection. Moving down, we have the option to choose compressor type, either a single compressor or tandem compressors. I'm going to stick with the single compressor. I skipped over the series section. This is currently grayed out. This will let you choose between a standard compressor or a very speed compressor. If we wanted to select that, I would need to change the refrigerant to something like R404A. Now that drop-down has been enabled, and I can choose a very speed compressor. And if I move down the screen and pick a compressor model, you'll notice that at the very bottom of the screen, we now have a frequency slider that's popped up. This will let me choose frequencies between the min and max for the compressor. And if I slide it, I actually get a results output. I would like to stick with a standard selection for now, and I'm going to choose a refrigerant of R407A. Just below the compressor model selection, you might notice that we have a checkbox to include former types. This would be good if you're looking for information on one of our previous models, say a 4C1480PL. I'm going to choose a compressor type of a 4VES-7, and I'm going to make this a low temp selection. So I'm going to go with minus 30 and 120 condensing. Below our operating point, we have options for liquid subcooling in the condenser or liquid temperature after the condenser. These are both representing condenser subcooling. So this will increase your compressor and evaporator capacity as well as your condenser capacity. If you're using an external subcooling, then you would need to use the parallel section of our software, which we'll go over later. I'm going to choose liquid subcooling of 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Below this, we have options for suction gas temperature and suction superheat. I'm going to stick with the constant return gas temperature of 60, sorry, 30 degrees. Moving on, we have useful superheat, which is currently grayed out and set to a default of 100%. This represents the differentiation between superheat picked up in the evaporator and elsewhere. 100% means that our compressor capacity and evaporator capacity are going to be the same, or all of your superheat is picked up in the evaporator. To the right, we have another info button. 
which gives a graphical representation of this along with a little more detailed description. I'm going to use a useful superheat of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to skip over operating mode for now and come back to that later. We also have options to change your capacity control. Uh, in this case, 100%, 50%, and virtually stepless. If this were a six-cylinder compressor, we would have options for 100%, 66%, 33%, and virtually stepless. Um, virtually stepless basically allows you to input values between 10 and 100%, just like we did with the frequency on the very speed compressor. Changing the slider will automatically give you some results. I'd like to stick with 100% for now. I'm going to go ahead and calculate a, our selection. So this brings up some results that we've seen before. We have our cooling capacity, power input, condenser capacity, and mass flow. You might also notice that at the top we have this green box. This gives some basic application-related remarks along with a description of what the asterisk values mean below. In this case, it's a 65 return gas temperature and no subcooling. You can see this in the cooling capacity and the EER below. This is useful in doing some quick compressor com comparisons. For now, for the sake of our selection, I'm just going to ignore it. You might also notice that at the bottom of this page, our operating mode is switched to CIC, which is our liquid injection mode. And we skipped over this dropdown earlier, but we have options for auto, where the software will automatically choose an operating mode, standard, which is forcing your selection into a non-liquid injection mode, and CIC, which is our liquid injection mode. Moving on to our limits tab, you can see that our limits show they're for CIC liquid injection. So the software automatically chose this mode and updated the limits tab accordingly. I can change this and force a standard mode, run the calculation again, and I still get results in this case. You might also notice that the cooling capacity has changed. It's increased very slightly in standard mode. This is because CIC automatically derates the capacity to account for liquid injection. Looking back at the limits tab, we have a different operating window for the standard mode, and we have a legend towards the bottom of the screen. This is cut off right now. Instead of scrolling down, I can get rid of this show overview checkbox at the top and have a more full view of my application window. You'll also notice that at the top we have a drop down to select when different windows for different capacity control percentages, 50% or the virtually stepless between 10 and 49%. We made the selection for 100%, so I'm going to leave it here. In addition to the operating limits, we also have called out sections that are colored for additional requirements, additional cooling via a head fan or suction gas limiting requirements. You might also notice that M1 and M2 have been called out here. These represent different motor versions that we have. Motor version 1, which is a high temp motor, this is the same as our previous models, PH and SH. This encapsulates the entire operating window. Motor 2, which only goes up to this dashed line, is the low temp motor version, which is the previous SLPL motors. Now, you can notice this in the model number as well. So our low temp motor, which we currently have selected, would be the 4VES7. The high temp motor version would be the 4VES10. So those last two digits represent your motor version. You can think of it as nominal horsepower. Um, the smaller number is always going to be your motor 2, and the higher is going to be your motor 1. Not shown in this graph, we also have a motor version three, which is for R134A only applications. This is a low medium temp motor. One nice feature about this section, you might notice as my mouse scrolls around, we have a pop-up window next to it that describes what motor version I'm looking in and what temperatures my mouse is currently pointed to. If I click in this chart, it will change our operating points to the section I was currently clicking. Moving on to our dimensions page, we have three representations of the currently selected compressor with dimensions in millimeters along with connection ports called out. At the bottom of the page, 
We have download links for CAD drawings. Moving on to the information tab, we have a few general application remarks along with descriptions of our CIC liquid injection mode and the different motor versions that are available. Towards the bottom of this page, we also have a legend for the connection ports that were called out on the dimensions page. If we go back to our results, I'd like to go back to the original selection that I had of minus 30 and 120. Since I seem to be using the selection a lot, I can actually save my inputs to the software using the save icon at the top of the page. This will save a Bitzer file, which can later be opened. This is very convenient if you're using a selection multiple times, say with the same refrigerant or the same compressor, or maybe even just a low temp selection with the same conditions. I can also output a PDF file by clicking the Acrobat icon at the top. Doing so brings up another window, which allows custom headlines to be input, along with selections of what sheets you would like to include in the PDF. So far, all of our selections have been done for a single operating point. If I would like to view something with multiple operating points, I can choose the tables icon at the top, which conveniently looks like a table. Here we have options to set a saturated suction temp and a step value stepping down along with three different condensing temps. Since this is a low temp selection, I'm going to choose saturated suction temp of 15 and go ahead and calculate the data for my table. As you can see, the table is fully populated in this case. Scrolling down, we have a legend for the table along with a download link to output a CSV file. Below that, we have another download link to retrieve compressor coefficients along with the polynomial that they would apply to above. An important note about the coefficients, all of your compressor inputs on the left-hand side of the screen, aside from your operating point, evaporating temperature and condensing temperature, must be input to retrieve a valid set of coefficients. If I were to change liquid subcooling or return gas temperature or voltage, this would change my coefficients. Now, we've looked at multiple operating points. If we wanted to choose multiple compressors, say in a rack application, I can do so by going back to our main page and clicking on the parallel compound section of the software using the icon, which looks like two schematic compressors at the top. This is similar to the original selection page with the addition of multiple operating points. I'm going to go with four. And the option to choose multiple compressors. I'll leave the default at three, but we can go up to 10. I'm going to change the compressor selection slightly and start with a four TES-9 compressor. Now, you may have noticed that when I chose this compressor, my previous, my following two compressors were altered as well. This is a convenience feature that assumes you'll be using the same compressor or similar compressors for your selection. This is nice here because I'm going to go with a TES-12 afterwards, actually a PES-12, and a 4NES-14. For the operating point, I'm going to go with a saturated suction temp that's floating between minus 20 and 10 with a maximum condensing temp of 110 and a minimum condensing temp of 70. Below the operating point, we have options for subcooling again. As I mentioned previously, this is the page we would need to use if we're choosing external subcooling. When I choose this, I still have the option for condenser subcooling, which I'm going to leave at zero. Now I have an additional dropdown to choose subcooling from the subcooler, either in subcooling from the subcooler or a liquid temp after the subcooler. I'm going to go with a liquid temp of 50 degrees. I'm going to maintain the same useful superheat as before. If I run the calculation, I get two modes to view my results. An overview mode, which we're currently in, which just shows a brief output of capacity, power, and EER for each operating point for the three compressors I've chosen. If I move to the detail section, I have a more detailed view of results along with the option to expand operating points and view data for individual compressors. 
Moving to the limits tab, you can see that four operating points have been included as of my selection. And this is currently in CIC mode. This is nice because I can see which operating points require additional cooling or liquid injection. Now, if we wanted to select something other than a compressor, an accessory, we can use the Accessories tab, which looks like a receiver in this case. Conveniently, the accessories we have available for the recips are receivers. This accessory type may change depending on which compressor type you have selected. And we already have a receiver that's been automatically calculated. One thing to note on this, these are the German receiver models. If you wanted an ASME receiver, which we make here in Oakwood, you could output a software selection from this, send it to us, and we can cross to an ASME version. Finally, to wrap this up, I'm going to look at the options window at the upper left-hand side of the screen. We have the same options as before for country, language, and units, along with a few standard headlines for PDF export. We also have a checkbox below this, which will allow you to calculate your condensing capacity with natural convection. This will slightly decrease your condensing capacity, and it can be used for calculating heat loads in an engine room. If I wanted to do so, I could check this box, run a software selection, uncheck it, run the same selection again, and take the difference between my condensing capacities. This would be the heat load for that room. Another nice feature that we have here is the separator symbol for CSV export. I mentioned exporting CSV files earlier for the tables and the coefficients. Default is a semicolon. I can change this to a comma, and if I were to open the CSV file in a program such as Excel, it might automatically delimitate the file for me without having to use a delimitating function such as text to columns in Excel. So, this concludes the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. If you have any questions, please contact your regional sales manager, or you can send them to tech support at bitsrus.com. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future sections, those would be appreciated as well. Thank you.